Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I'll just start with a couple of announcements. First of all, the last Wellness 101 conference call series for the year starts Tuesday, October 30th and runs for four consecutive weeks. Uh, we're always trying to change things up at the Wellness Forum to make them a little bit better, improve the system and so this time what we've done is we've added a lot of material to the conference calls that we don't talk about in the curriculum book or on the DVDs. So even if you've read the curriculum book from cover to cover and you've watched all the DVDs and faithfully taken notes, you still can learn some more things on these conference calls. So um, you can call the office to get information on that. And then um, conversations with Dr. Pam, Wednesday, November 7th, and we're going to give equal treatment to men. I've been talking a lot about mammography uh, testing for women and that it's not advisable. We're going to talk about PSA testing, which is just as important for men to know about as mammography testing, and the information about that is important for women to know about. And then last but not least, our conference is coming up November 2nd through 4th with John McDougall, Neil Barnard, Peter Bregan, Larry Polovsky, all-star cast. You can't miss it, so uh, make sure you get in touch with us to attend this fabulous event. If you're anywhere in driving distance particularly, you just got to be here. So with that, let's get on to some news. And I try to do a number of different things with these clips, um, sometimes to cover studies. I'm going to do one of those that uh, has gotten some attention lately and um, other times to give some editorial on what I think is going on that's messed up. And I want to talk about the American medical system, talk about something that's messed up. It's about as dysfunctional as it can get and it's hard to know sometimes where to start to unravel this mess. Um, I've been doing my part, I guess, training health professionals and teaching individuals how to make better decisions about diet and health and medicine and that sort of thing. Um, I think that's done a lot to, to change, to help people drop out of the system, not really to change the system. Um, to change the system, it's very challenging because, particularly from a cost standpoint, um, because the system is organized in such a convoluted fashion. And there was a great editorial about this. I thought this guy really um, encapsulated what's wrong with the system. His name is Thomas Sowell. He's with the Hoover Institute. Uh, he writes um, a syndicated column that sometimes sends up in the Columbus newspaper. That's where I saw it. His t um, the title of the article is Insurance Should Deal With Risk, if you want to look it up online and read the original article. But he rightly points out that the purpose of insurance is to take care of something that people can't take care of for themselves. In other words, if my house burns down, it would be virtually impossible for me to rebuild it and refurnish it with my own money. So I have insurance in case, God forbid, something like that happens. The problem is when we start expecting, for example, homeowners insurance companies to cover fixing the sidewalk, trimming the trees, replacing a rotted deck on the uh, rotted board on my deck, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so that's what's happened with um, health insurance by asking insurance companies to increasingly cover things that are not really a matter of risk. I mean, you can just count on having to do some stuff to maintain your house, right? Um, you can just count on having to do some things to maintain your body. But, but if people love to pressure politicians to pressure insurance companies to cover things that don't involve risk. So one good example that he uses is the annual exam. And aside from the fact, and I've written about this, that it's been been determined to be useless by just about every organization in the country, it has nothing to do with risk. Annual exams take place, uh, well, annually. That makes them not risk. And so predictable events, because they're not a risk factor, really kind of mess up the reimbursement system and the cost of health care because um, it becomes very expensive to cover that kind of stuff. And a doctor's visit is more expensive if it's part of an insurance plan because of the paperwork and the filing for reimbursement and that sort of thing. So it just all contributes to our bloated health care plan, our health care budget. And what this means is that no matter how well all of us take care of ourselves, we're still going to be victimized by high costs of insurance and healthcare in general. Um, another problem is legislators love to pressure insurance companies to cover all kinds of conditions like male pattern baldness, anything actually that has an advocacy group. And sometimes the advocacy groups are the medical profession, the drug companies, or consumer groups funded by those people who say, look, you guys ought to go lobby Congress to make sure that you're taken care of and we'll even put up some money for you to do it. So it looks like citizens are really interested in this. So it doesn't really cost the politicians anything, but these services aren't free. When insurance companies justifiably raise premiums to cover the new free stuff, people complain about the greedy insurance companies that only care about themselves instead of people. And I've experienced this myself. Now that mammography and all kinds of stuff that I don't want to do are 
free, well, I mean, we know there's no such thing as free service, right? My own insurance has gone up, and I've made a claim on it since 1994. I just don't think that's fair. Our convoluted regulatory system also says that insurance companies are regulated by states, which means that they have 50 different regulatory schemes to deal with instead of just competing with one another at the national level. And this also adds to our costs. So how could we improve this situation? Well, I'm an advocate for getting the government out of the way and letting the marketplace determine what insurance companies should cover and what their policies should look like. Let's allow insurance companies to go back to covering the things that are truly risky. Um, these are things that, like heart attacks and strokes and cancer, that are expensive, but fortunately don't happen to everybody. So the idea of pooled funds to cover just the disasters works just fine, just like it does with automobiles and homeowners insurance. And one good byproduct of this, if we went back to that type of a system, as people would be incentivized to take better care of themselves. In other words, one of the incentives for maintaining your property is so that, uh, because you're responsible for it, is so that it doesn't completely fall apart. You can't count on anybody else to pay for these kinds of things. So this would be a way to reduce costs. And I think we at some point in time have to pay attention to the way that the insurance and reimbursement system is structured if we expect to make a dent in healthcare costs. So, I've dropped out of the system, personally, as much as I can. I take care of myself. I don't get sick. I don't have tests. I don't take drugs. Yet, just for basic insurance to cover disasters, the costs keep going up. And so, anyway, that's my thought on the matter. Again, the editorial from which I drew the material is by Thomas Sowell. It's called Insurance Should Deal with Risk, and I'm sure you can find him online. He's a very prolific writer and commentator. Now, the other thing I wanted to cover is a great um, article that appeared in um, a journal called Nature Communications, and it's about high-fat diets during pregnancy. Now, I think all women know that it's really important to eat well during pregnancy. They know for a fact that they're less likely to have diabetes and high blood pressure, complications associated with pregnancy. Um, and also, and I put out quite a few messages and articles about this, the taste preferences of children actually start in the womb. So if you want a kid that's more predisposed to eat vegetables, eat a lot of vegetables when you're pregnant, you'll be surprised how much that will help your child to enjoy those kinds of foods later on. But um, I thought this was very interesting. There's a growing body of evidence, and the study I'm going to share with you is certainly not the only one I've seen. And in fact, I took a CME program um, that was delivered by a doctor who'd written a book on this topic that a woman's risk of developing breast cancer is related to her mother's diet during pregnancy. In this particular study, researchers found that daughters and granddaughters of rats fed a high-fed diet had a 55 to 60% increased risk of breast cancer, and daughters of rats given synthetic estrogen had a 50% increase of breast cancer, and this increase was passed down through three generations. So what this means is that women consuming the standard American diet, which is very high in fat, and includes dairy products, which contain estrogen metabolites, are unknowingly increasing their future daughter's risk of breast cancer. This information is important. Responsible pregnant women are careful not to smoke, they're careful not to drink alcohol, consume caffeine, or engage in any activity that might hurt their baby. But nobody is telling them that their dietary pattern can have such a profound effect on their daughter's health. And I have to believe that if women were made aware of this, many would be willing to make significant changes in their dietary pattern. I thought it was very interesting. The researchers concluded at the end of all of this that what this should lead to is some kind of a blood test that determines whether or not somebody is, or the woman is at increased risk of breast cancer due to the, these factors. And I'm opposed to all of that. I don't like this genetic testing. Uh, first of all, there's no evidence that it's really uh, uh, reducing the, the uh, number of deaths from conditions like breast cancer or prostate cancer. But the other thing is that it turns patients into victims, it subjects them to unnecessary treatment, and it ignores the fact that genetics really is a very tiny percentage of the, of the uh, risk for developing a disease. You might be genetically predisposed, but your um, diet and lifestyle habits are the most important determinants of whether or not you're going to uh, develop a certain disease. So I think the usefulness of this information is to to really continue to spread the word about the importance of eating a plant-based diet. And um, if women really want to give every advantage they can to their babies, and I've found most of them really do, the best thing they can do is eat a low-fat plant-based diet that not only protects them and makes for a healthier pregnancy, but offers both their daughters and sons the best chance for a healthy future. So that's all for now. Feel free, as always, to pass this on to anybody that you think would be interested in listening to it. And I will be back to you on Thursday.